our first finalist on the on the Android side is going to be Philip Larson uh, from the Department of Informatics here at the University of Oslo. Um, and thank you, welcome. Uh, he's going to have seven minutes, so it's it's kind of brutal, but hopefully he can hopefully he can do it. <laughs> I'm I'm sure that he can. Um, and then we'll have two more uh, Android finalists following him. And whenever you're ready, take it away. Thank you. Yeah, hello. My name is uh, Philip Christoph Larsen. I'm a former master student here at the University of Oslo. And today I'm going to present the cold chain monitoring application, which is a sensor-based application using DJI's to capture app. So I was fortunate to pilot the project in uh, Zambesa in Mozambique, where we implemented that four health facilities, providing uh, tablets to health facility workers and training them using the application for digitizing a manual temperature reading process. So the problem uh, with cold chain monitoring uh, is that people are vaccinated with vaccines that may be unsafe due to insufficient temperature during storage and handling. As immunization programs grow, the complexity increase and the need to strengthen components like cold chain monitoring and logistic management is critical. And uh, the unit cost of vaccines has increased from $1 per child in 2001 to about $28 in 2014. So therefore poor vaccine handling can have significant financial consequences. So how can the cold chain monitoring improve control? This is the current uh, cold chain monitoring in Mozambique, uh, paper-based uh, solution. And we are using a digital Bluetooth sensor to monitor temperatures. Uh, it's portable, providing a use case where you can bring it to vaccination campaigns and rural vaccination. And application prompt real-time alerts and provide historical data for analysis in DJIS2. Recording in progress. Okay. <laughs> nice to know. Uh, so the tech, how do I remove? It's it's not showing on my screen. Wait, it's ah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thirty seconds actually. Yeah. <laughs> So the digital solution is uh, two parts. It's the hardware, the Bluetooth sensor from Blue Maestro with a battery, battery lifetime of two years. It costs $35 and when you purchase it, it's no subscription or additional costs uh, like other cold chain monitoring solutions and it's fully waterproof. And then there's the application, uh, which is a custom Android application using the Android SDK and tracker capture to store temperature readings locally in a database, providing local alerts, of course, functioning offline and uh, exporting of the uh, temperatures to a CSV file, just in case. So you can see the temperature flows from the sensor captured by the Android application. And then when you have internet connection, you can upload temperature readings to DJI's two servers providing uh, analysis for decision makers. And now I'm going to show a demo of the application. So the first thing you do is logging into your DJS2 instance, uh, granting access to Bluetooth and location. And then you synchronize your tracker program, metadata and data, and you can start this. Selecting one, it automatically connects to it. And you can see the current temperature, minimum, maximum, average, last 24 hour. And you can collect uh, temperature stored in the local database. Uh, further, the graph will uh, update when new readings arrive. So the uh, application automatically listens to changes of temperature so you can capture. 
you can see the database, uh, the local database, uh, which are going to, and you can uh, set threshold for the alerts with a minimum and maximum threshold. And if you're above or, or below, it will send a local notification. So health workers can uh, improve. You can export the local database as a CSV file uh, if you lose something, so you can uh, upload it manually. And you can also clear clear the database if you want to have a have a clean <laughs> clean sheet. And lastly, by pressing upload, uh, the data will uh, be uploaded to a tracker program on a tracked entity instance and store the temperatures as events in, in the DJIS2. So you can use data visualizer to visualize the data. So, <laughs> thank you. So the goal of the cold chain monitoring app is to reduce the number of spoiled vaccines to improving temperature control during storage and handling and reduce complexity by introducing cold chain monitoring as a support for DJIS2 platform ecosystem and increase the global health and immunization by reducing number of spoiled vaccines with a cost efficient cold chain monitoring application. Uh, furthermore, the scaling and further developer development of the app is that the Android uh, team uh, is recruiting a de dedicated LMIS developer. And this will be one of top two priorities for his LMIS team uh, in Oslo. Mozambique is also interested in uh, extending the pilot and the application will search for WHO PQS. So, Thank you so much to the team, to Sadigitus, to his PLMIS, uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, next up. We have David from JSI uh, presenting another Android application. Okay. Good. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm David Boone from JSI and the PMI Measure Malaria Project. I'm here to present a new tool, an Android app that we have designed to measure data quality at health facilities, uh, as part particularly those, the data in source documents, the client register, client encounter forms, et cetera. Those data that are then aggregated and reported up monthly according to precise uh, indicator definitions. This is often an aspect of data quality that is overlooked because it requires a visit to a health facility. So data quality assurance is important. I think we'll all agree, but let's face it, it's no fun. I like to think of it as like housekeeping. No one wants to do it, but if it doesn't get done, things get pretty funky. It's often done by large health facility assessments on a sample of health facilities, which are expensive, so they're infrequent. Sometimes this is done more, frequent, more routinely, for example, as part of health facility supervision. These efforts often lack coordination in terms of what is being assessed, how it's being assessed, and when, with little possibility of deriving global conclusions for improvement. Measure, at Measure Malaria, we created the MRDQA in Excel, and we've been using that for a couple of years in PMI countries to good effect. We took the decision to adapt this to Android to facilitate the use of the tool and aggregation of data to subnational and national levels. This way we can compare results at facilities across districts and over time to get a better idea of where the problems are occurring. The app comes with a DHIS2 configuration package, i.e. metadata and dashboards to facilitate the visualization of results. We think this more coordinated and standardized approach to routine data quality checks will yield more efficient targeting of resources for uh, data quality improvement. 
So let's look at the app. And this is a live demo, so bear with me. Uh, first go to the menu. And we would need to configure the app for first time use. You can see here we are connected to a test server at JSI. Come over here, you can see the name of the data set that we're connected to on the DHIS2. You'll see throughout the app, there are information icons. If we click twice, we can get more information about the screen we're looking at. And importantly, on this tab, we can see the supervisions that have been saved to DHIS2. And this permits us to standardize the approach across supervision teams, across facilities, and across this is using the same configuration of the app in the same supervisory period, and we can get comparable data. So you see here the two uh, configurations that we use for our pilot tests in Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire uh, this month. If we go to here, we can see we can pull down health facilities and indicators from the DHIS2 and add them to the local device for indicators and data elements as well. Here we can take a look at what's already on the local device in terms of facilities and indicators. So having configured the tool, we can go plan a supervision. We can add a new one, or we can look at one that existing. We see the name and the, the referent period for the data quality checks. We can push that to DHS2, or we can edit it. Here we can see the referent periods selected. We can select uh, reporting periods for accuracy checks, and we can select metrics for the supervision. We don't have to do them all every time. Okay, after having planned the supervision, we can go to data entry. We select our supervision. We select the health facility, and then we can enter data on completeness and timeliness, completeness of data sources and data elements. We can enter data on accuracy. This is the monthly values recounted compared to the value in the monthly report and also to the value in the DHIS2 for the same reporting period. This allows us to calculate a verification factor, which is an indicator of the accuracy of reporting. We can also add reasons for discrepancy. Why was there a discrepancy if one was found? We can also conduct cross checks, which is a comparison of different data sources with similar data, such as the malaria case register against the laboratory register. We expect that the data in there for the same period would cohere. And we can conduct consistency checks, consistency over time in terms of annual consistency, the current month data against the same month last year, or the current month data against the average of the three preceding months. We can also conduct a system assessment, which is a qualitative look at the reporting system at the facility, are all the elements in place to produce good quality data or not? And then having entered all the data, we can go to our dashboard. And for that supervision and that facility, we can check the result of the cross check, the verification factor for the accuracy check, reasons for discrepancy, and then reporting performance and readiness to produce good quality data. We can also export that to uh, DHIS2 or to a CSV file. So I know you're all thinking, where can I get this app? I'm sorry to say it's not quite ready. Uh, we just pilot tested two weeks ago in Sierra Leone and Cote d'Ivoire. It worked pretty well. We did find some bugs. So we will be addressing those in the next couple of months. We will be uh, developing guidance for setting up and using the tools in countries. And then we'll make that available in the DHIS2 app repository and Google Play Store. Uh, we will send around a notification on the community of practice for when that's ready. We believe this app will improve coordination of data quality checks and the use of findings for data quality improvement, but there are no shortcuts. Data quality is hard. It still requires commitment at national and district levels to collect the data, track results over time, and develop and implement interventions to improve data quality. We see big potential for use of this in other health and disease programs because the indicators are practically incidental to the app. They can be easily swapped out.
And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, David. Next up, we have Vincent Munda, Minda from the University of Dar es Salaam. David, I think maybe you need to. Good afternoon. Yeah, so my name is Vincent Minde. I am a lead software developer at the University of Islam, DHS2 Lab. Uh, yeah, if it's one skill that I've had to learn ever since I came to Oslo is to cram down a, com a complicated scenario into seven minutes. I mean, uh, I'll try, let's see if I've mastered the craft. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about an app called uh, EID Sara. Uh, I think some of you may be aware of an integrated disease surveillance and response uh, mechanisms around different countries where uh, there is sort of, uh, you have to track whenever there is an outbreak and things like that, you have to track, you know, the occurrences of diseases before they, you know, break out into uncontrollable scenarios. One example could be COVID, for example. Yeah, so, I'm a geek, so I'm going to start a little bit with the design. Uh, some of you may have already heard about DHIS2 Touch, which is a standard developer SDK. For those who are not geeks, I'm sorry about that. But uh, it's just an SDK to help you, you know, create apps on top of DHIS2 in an easy way. And we have created it in Flutter, which is, uh, you know, upcoming uh, UI framework and things like that. Uh, so. For those geeks who understand what I'm talking about. Uh, so we've had to sort of uh, create uh, an, a mobile app to sort of monitor diseases in Tanzania called EIDSR. And as of now, it is, uh, for those who are familiar with EIDSR, there is, you know, the ind indicator-based surveillance where you, you look at uh, certain indicators which allow you to to know what is going on in the ground before you know disease diseases can uh, can you know outbreak. Uh, but there's also uh, event based surveillance, uh, which is based on various events that are happening in the community and things like that. Uh, these are the IDSR implementation in Tanzania started a while ago, where we used certain technology called USSD which had a lot of challenges in terms of, you know, uh, that's too complicated. I don't I have seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there were a lot of challenges to a degree that we decided that maybe we should go with a mobile app. It will probably help us with, uh, you know, reporting diseases on time and, you know, providing an easy mechanism to respond to those diseases. Uh, the second advantage actually is something that we, we are trying to standardize the AIDSR. Uh, as I said, we've implemented it in Tanzania as of now, and the second implementation is going on in Zanzibar. And what we are trying to do is actually standardize the entire process of disease surveillance. Uh, and our vision to a degree is we want to standardize the process to such a degree that uh, if we didn't know about COVID and it happened today, you should be able to, to, to customize DHS2 within three to five days, uh, such that you can start surveilling the disease within those three or five days. So that is the idea of the standardization we're doing in, uh, in this IDSR mobile app. Uh, one other advantage is the cost reduction uh, based on what we used to do before that. Uh, at least for now, the previous technologies were a little bit uh, too costly in terms of their implementation. So this was also built to resolve that. So, and as you can see there, there is also MCBS, which is basically malaria uh, case-based surveillance. Uh, this is specific to malaria, which is just one implementation that has been done in Tanzania. But the idea is that if there is a malaria case that has happened, it will be reported through the IBS, which is the indicator-based surveillance. And then after that, there will be a trigger to follow up on such malaria cases so that they can, you know, ensure that a breakout uh, 
an outbreak does not happen or something like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I was going to go a little bit into the features, but uh, I would prefer to sort of, given the time being, I prefer to go directly to a simple demo. Uh, this is the app, and you also have to enter a code. Uh, who, there were some sort of data uh, needs, uh, data private needs that were needed by the means. So, yeah, so with the database surveillance, and by the way, there is in GitHub, as you saw, there was IBS, EBS, and SBS. The EBS is still in development in Tanzania. Uh, and uh, yeah, so the IBS is, is implemented already in Tanzania. It's now been implemented in Zanzibar. The EBS is still under development in, in Tanzania now. And with the IBS, there's usual, for those who know, it is uh, as usual weekly reporting and the immediate reporting. So the Android app, basically, as of now, uh, you can sort of uh, uh, report weekly on the various diseases that were chosen to sort of be monitored by the IDSR. Uh, but you can also produce immediate reports, reporting immediately for those diseases that need immediate attention, for example, COVID or Ebola and such kind of diseases. Uh, so in the app, we have a little bit of a summary. I'm going to pick here a date. Oh, and one minute. Jesus. Uh, okay, so there is a little bit of a summary of, the, of COVID cases that somebody can look at. Uh, there is also the functionality of notifications. In IDSI, you really need notifications so as to, you know, address uh, any upcoming outbreaks, things like that. You need to do that pretty fast. So we had to develop a mechanism to notify people so that they can work on them fast. Uh, these notifications also involve telling the user, reminding them of, you know, notifying uh, the week, reporting weekly reports and things like that. There are also various features around, you know, uh, uploading data, seeking data, you know, offline support and things like that. These were uh, part of what is needed in Tanzania as long as such that because there is, you know, a lot of areas where there's no enough internet to sort of work on uh, report incidences and things like that. So, Huh. This seven minutes. Anyways, so now uh, the last thing I would go to was through the data entry, but you know, you people already know so much about data entry. So I don't think uh, just a simple thing in data entry is just we decided to create a sort of interface which is easier to enter data. And yeah, I think that should be enough. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> Have I mastered the craft? So thank you very much to all three of our Android finalists. Remember, you'll have to vote between those three for one of the winners. And then the next three web finalists will have a separate winner. So two different categories. I'd now like to introduce our first web finalist, uh, which is from the organization Crosscut, uh, application about microplanning. Uh, Coit Manuel will be joining us uh, remotely. So hopefully we can get that up here. Uh, I think it should. Is this is this Coit's screen now? Coit, can you speak and, and see if we can hear Yeah, you? can you hear me? Yeah, great. We've got a voice from Ana Hi coming in. Uh, from the United States, I believe. Um, quite, uh, whenever okay, you're awesome. ready, take it away. Thanks, Austin. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Coit Mayo, and I'm sorry to not be able to be there in person, but this is the CrossCut app. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Awesome. So what's micro planning? The different health programs often mean something a little different when they refer to micro planning, but generally it's talking about public health planning that's happening below the district level. And that's really the key point to remember. So common elements of micro planning include identifying settlements, creating maps, estimating the populations, usually those associated with health facilities and forecasting supplies and resources. Mapping is an integral part of microplanning, and microplanning is an integral part of uh, public health. 
The most common map that's used in microplanning is the catchment area map. So catchment area maps show the geographic area that's served by a particular health site. Some health programs create these maps by hand drawing them like the one you see on the right. Some health programs engage in technical assistance. It, it might last weeks or months where external experts produce digital catchment area maps using advanced geospatial calculations. This catchment area mapping, whether it's hand-drawn or more advanced techniques, this is happening every year in almost every country where DHIS2 is being used. So now you can create these catchment area maps directly in DHIS2 using the Crosscut app. You've probably seen many of the cool new maps that are available in DHIS2 already. Maybe you've tried to create some micro planning apps like here's shows the sites and the district boundaries. Uh, these are views that might be familiar to you. Maybe you've done, um, maybe you've done some uh, dashboard maps like those here showing BCG coverage at the district level on the left or the health facility level on the right. So the, with the Crosscut app, you're actually able to go from this view to this view. So what, what the Crosscut app does is basically divide, it allows you to easily divide up the district into catchment areas for each health facility. So that's what the black lines are that you see here. So instead of just looking at the district lines, you see the, the catchment area lines. We've overlaid here the locations of where the actual settlements are within the catchment area. That's also a cool new feature of DHIS2. Uh, using the Google building footprint. So this combination of catchment area boundaries and settlement locations is extremely powerful. And so my question to you is which of these two views do you think is more insightful? Which one's gonna help more? The one on the left with the app or the one on the right without it? Similarly, the coverage maps or the dashboard maps, you probably have produced many of these in DHIS2. Now you can use your catchment area map, your, your catchment areas that you create with the Crosscut app to make much cooler heat maps. That's what you see here. And so same question as before, which of these two views do you think is more insightful? Which are you gonna get more information from, the one on the left or the one on the right? So this is what the Crosscut app lets you do. It's very easy to find. It's uh, available with the latest release of DHIS2, 2.38 or later. You can find it right in the app hub. So let's check it out. The DHIS2 uh, micro planning app that we developed is extremely basic. It doesn't do a lot of things. It really just does one thing, and that's create catchment area maps. So how do you do it? You basically click the button. You pick your country. We'll use Sierra Leone and do a test. Then you pick the level where your facilities are and click create. That's what's involved in creating the catchment area maps. So part of our vision and our hope with this app is that we can rapidly speed up the time that it takes to produce these types of maps. So right now, while we're waiting on this to run, because that's what's happening right now is it's literally producing the map. So it's running hundreds of thousands of calculations. It's looking, it factors in uh, the land cover, the elevation, the road network, the location of rivers and roads, to really try to produce accurate depictions of where the actual catchments are in the areas that are serviced by an individual health facility. So it's not just drawing a line across the middle of a mountain, it's factoring in the mountain to the travel time and actually trying to calculate something a little more accurate. So what that also lets you do is get a better estimate of the target population for that particular area. So there you see that it's run and then to push it in the DHIS all you do is push publish. Our DHIS2 app is available today on the App Hub with 2.38. You can also come to our website, check out the full featured app, uh, which includes travel time heat maps, printable map downloads, and boundary adjustments, and more. 
Uh, bound, you know, I've got a little time looking at the clock here. So I'll mention the boundary adjustments. All of our boundaries are calculated automatically. But if you don't like these for some reason, and people always don't like them <laughs> completely, something will be wrong about how the calculation was done based on the local knowledge. Um, you are actually able to easily edit these without any need to for any sort of, you don't need to know QGIS, you don't need any sort of advanced geospatial analytical ability. You just need the ability to kind of paint the lines differently. So that's not currently available in the DHS2 app, that's available on our website, but the two are synced, so you stay in alignment at all times. So we really hope that you all are able to check it out and try it out. And I really appreciate the opportunity to demo. Thanks. Awesome, thank you, Koi. And I'm glad that we can see your face now, Koi, so, so you can wave to everyone in, in your last 30 seconds. <laughs> All straight, right. steaming so straight have, from my uh, attic here. ICT. Can you hear me? Yeah. So hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, here to, to, to tell you a story. I have only seven minutes and I'm from Spain. So you see the issue here. Um, we have really a problem there. Um, I will try to do my best, really. I'm sorry if I'm not able. Um, so if you, uh, this story is about, this story is about all of you. Because all of you are instances, you don't have only one user. You have more than one user, and you need to do like big configurations in, in those instances. Either you are the one that is doing the configuration, or you are the one asking for someone to do it. Please be kind with this guy, because it's having a, a bad day. So um, actually, uh, we are not only doing, we, we love doing generic apps that are also um open source we really love open source and everything is there so please contribute um it's not not the only one that you the, that you will see from us so maybe we you know us from any of these training app to build trainings or to sync metadata build packages um export import into excel uh, create with a couple of comments at dhs to instance with it to docker import from google earth engine any data or or maybe um, the same principle that I'm going to show you with predictors is also available. And so you, when you get to a, like the, the information that you're going to use DHS2, you're super happy. Uh, first thing is super happy. And now that no one from DHS2 core can hear us, um, seems like there is an issue with understanding the user roles and the authorities and all that. And, and time matters actually. So you start, you say, okay, I got it, everything. Now I can do it. You put everything in, in place and then the big boss arrives and say, you know what? These guys from Afro ending uh, the username by X and being bit data visualizer, they need to be added with this particular authority. And that happens and that keeps happening and you get a mess in your DHS too and actually that's a, a big problem for many organizations. You, you, we have seen uh, many different user configuration paradigms, like uh, people that like to use user role as a user profile, people that like to use user role as a group of authorities, no matter which one you are using. Maybe we are missing in DHS to something called user profile or something like that, um, like to apply template for one user to another. Uh, actually, this is what one of the things that you can do with user extended app. I'm gonna try to, I feel lucky, so I'm gonna try to uh, do a demo and uh, yeah. And I don't have a session. Okay, so when you access user extended app, actually what you get is a list of your users. No. 
is you are, you are trying to operate on your users. First thing that you want to do is, okay, let's try to filter, to locate my user. So uh, maybe you want to look for the IT guys, and so you're filtering real time. Um, you might want to look for the managers, um, anything you can. You can, uh, by clicking here, uh, decide what is shown in uh, which columns are shown in um, in the uh, what in the list. So you can add, you can remove um, whatever you you need. Okay. Um, but yeah, sometimes you you don't know the username. You need to look for like apply a more complex filter. We have thought on that. So actually, you can filter by the active users. You can filter by role, group. You can filter by the organization unit. So the, the idea of locating a user is more, more or less something that we have found in the past. Um, we understand you. And, uh, and then in user extended app, you have two type two different type of actions. I, I'm not going to explain all of them because I, I think, whoa. Um, I'm going to explain only a couple of them. And actually, you can do single actions and you can do bulk actions. So the single actions are almost anything that you can do on a normal edition of a user, like changing the properties and enabling, disabling, removing, anything like that. Something I want to focus your attention on is this copying user. So sometimes you have a user template and you want to propagate that user template into many users. So just take the template, you say copy and user, you decide which user will be applied with that template and uh, for example, all these, and you decide which strategy you want to use like merging or replacing. You want those users to become a data visualizer or you want those users to just be a data visualizer. Um, and then you can decide if it is user role, groups, uh, whatever that you are um, gonna be copying. And then sometimes, uh, you also want to replicate just the user. So you can do something like, okay, I'm gonna replicate three times that user, but it's not exactly the same user that I want. So I want to change the organization unit or I want to change the um, organization unit for visualization or anything, the username, whatever you want, what you want to replicate. Okay, and then immediately you get a copy or three copies or n, n copies. And that's fine. Um, but it becomes even funnier when you, you execute a bulk action. And there are two bulk actions I want to show you. One is that you can edit on a table. So actually you can click on edit and you see a table and you can change property for all those users that you have selected. One minute, okay. And uh, I'll do it quickly. I hope I will have the time. Um, the latest thing, and that's one of the uh, good ideas of Oh, we think um, on the user extended app is that you can actually export that into a CSV. Um, you can open that CSV. Um, okay, you are seeing exactly the same columns that you are uh, seeing in the in the web app, and you can even add more properties. Like I want to change the password. If that property exists in the user, that will be changed. Actually, you can change whatever you, however you want. There is a validation when you upload it back and, and will tell you if that is okay or not. And I'm gonna very quickly show you, um, yeah, let's say, and, and then you can import it back by selecting the file. You get an intermediate screen where you still have a last say, like, okay, there are validations, all the validation from the HS2 are applied on the slide. So, um, all do those users exist already. So I do I want to override them and then change the configuration and you can decide to just create new, new users. And that's it. Thank you so much. Woo! Thank you very much, Nacho. Next up, we have one more uh, remote uh, participant from HISP, uh, <laughs> from HISP Tanzania. Um, Gift uh, Nko will be joining us remotely. Hopefully he can share his screen. Gift, I hope you can hear me and can share your screen. I'm surprised this is the first technical yeah. difficulty. There we go. Yeah. Hi Gift, can you, can you speak so we can make sure you can hear, we can hear you and then share your screen? Yes, hi Austin. Hi Gift. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm just, okay. 
Oops. Yeah, so let me share my screen. And please tell me if you can see it. Can't see it yet. There we go, perfect. Okay, um, yes. Um, sorry, yes, let me just finish up setting up. Okay, um, yes, can I start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gift. I'm a system developer from HISP Tanzania, and I'll be presenting to you the program indicator disaggregator. Uh, the program indicator disaggregator is a custom DHS2 application that uh, enables automatic generation of disaggregations from a generic program indicator based on different categories. So despite being crucial for tracker data analysis, program indicators configuration has been uh, sometimes required to have disaggregations by different categories based on specific data elements, attribute, constant, or variables. Now to achieve this, um, multiple program indicators are configured with the same consideration, with the, with, with the consideration of the intended disaggregation. This is normally done by duplicating it and modifying it for each disaggregate. Now this might not be an issue for a smaller number of disaggregations, for example, gender. But in some cases, we may have uh, many disaggregates that may be needed to be uh, generated and this may be tedious and so we thought of a, uh, a useful way to automate this process and this is where the program indicator disaggregator comes in so the program indicator disaggregator uh, collectively collectively allows management of disaggregated program indicator from the app you can see a list of already configured program indicators from which you can select a generic indicator the, the app also allows configuration of automatic disaggregation based on data elements and program attributes. It also allows propagation of updates to disaggregations in case the generic program indicator has any updates. Uh, with the current app implementation, the app has proven to be efficient in resolving this challenge, uh, but we are planning to expand its functionality by adding support for disaggregation by variables and constants adding support for more operators like greater than, less than, ranges, and more. Uh, we also plan to add support for disaggregation by multiple data items. And of course, we also uh, plan to support uh, an elaborative program indicator dictionary explaining more about the indicators. But apart from that, we also expect to have some use cases from the community for those who are interested or uh, who are interested to use the application. And now maybe uh, let's jump into a very quick demo. Um, so if you could. So um, the, uh, the app can be accessed uh, through the uh, app menu in DHS2 and it's named Program Indicator Disaggregator. And when opened, it will show you a list of program indicators um, that are already configured within the system. And here is where you can select actually a generic program indicator from which to uh, disaggregate from. So for example, in our case, we're going to uh, see an example of a COVID case uh, uh, disaggregated by uh, different outcomes. So for example, we can have the, we can search the surveillance and then we can now choose the COVID case um, indicator. From here now, I uh, will see the, the, the chosen program indicator along with uh, different explanations. Uh, and then from this page also, it's where you can add your uh, disaggregation configuration. And here, uh, basically it is done in three steps. So first of all, you choose what you disaggregate by. And so, uh, for example, in our case, we want to disaggregate by data element. And then you choose the program stage in which you want to disaggregate from. And of course, the data, specific data elements. The second stage, basically you choose um, what values should be disaggregated uh, for this specific uh, indicator. So if, for example, in our case, this data element has uh, option sets tied to it, so automatically your option sets will be uh, shown here for you to choose. Uh, and, and in case we, you chose a data element that has, uh, is probably a free text, you can specify a custom value. 
So in our case, we're going to uh, select all. And then the, the last step is basically to choose a name prefix that will be appended uh, on the name and the short name for the generated disaggregation uh, program indicators. So maybe now, case we can just say outcome. Yes, so after that, you just simply uh, click save and just that like that on the fly, you have now five new um, disaggregations for the for these indicators and you can actually see them here. Now let's see uh, this uh, this uh, disaggregations in actions. So if we open our data visualizer and navigate to program indicators and then select our program, we can actually see now COVID cases has uh, these disaggregations that we generated. And um, yeah, we can also select a period that has data so that we can see. So let's choose. Uh, this year. Yes, and just like that, we now have disaggregations for the COVID-19 cases uh, simply uh, managed. But um, at some point, uh, there may be updates to this generic uh, program indicator. So for example, we want to change um, maybe an attribute of this. Uh, we can simply, let's say we're changing the short name to case, and then we can save. Then if we move back to our application and refresh on this. Um, so basically what will happen, you'll get a not notification that the generic indicator has been updated. And if necessary, you may need to propagate those updates to the disaggregations that have been generated. So you can easily do that just by clicking update. And just like that, all the uh, updates will be reflected to the uh, different uh, disaggregations. Uh, okay, um, I think that is all from us. Um, if you have more, uh, if you have more questions or if you want uh, more discussions, we have a posting in the community of practice. Uh, you can visit through this link or the um, capture, or you can contact us through the email info at histanzania.org. Thank you. Huge applause. Thank you very much. Gifts. Yeah. And I think we are just about on time. This is kind of amazing. Thank you very much, Gif, for, for sharing that. And to all of our finalists for the great presentations, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. And we will move to the, the most exciting part, the voting. So the, the stakes are high. Um, this, will, this will be automatically filled in with the, uh, the link in just a minute because I have a great team working with me. Um, the stakes are high, so the, the winners of this year's app competition will get a, a sponsored trip to next year's annual conference. So they will be here in front of you uh, and, and you can talk with them and, and they, can, they can experience the, the, the conference atmosphere. Um, and they'll also get lifetime recognition on the community of practice uh, with a badge um, that has been designed by, by Gassim, our community manager. Um, oh, hopefully Austin. This, will, this link will actually fill in. Uh, Herman, oh. you're, you're, on, you're online, right? You're trying to yeah, yeah, Yes, I need, I need uh, added access to the doc, sorry. Oh, I should have given it to you. Okay. Recording stopped. <laughs> Recording in progress. I think you should have it, sir. If not, send it to me and I can fill it in. Uh, there you go. Should be there. Uh... There we go. Uh, okay. It's on the, it's on this one here. That's okay. fine. Okay, great. Um, I also wanted to mention, so on the right side of the screen here, you have a link, uh, 3BOF capital A-N-L. Uh, that is where you need to go to vote. You have just a few minutes, so I'm actually also going to start a timer for this. Oops, too many, too many things. Sorry. <laughs> too many things. You have three minutes. Ready, go. So you have three minutes for the voting here. Um, and as this, as this goes forward, I will... Uh, Try to bring this back onto the top of the screen. But I also did want to mention three honorable mentions from our uh, submissions for the web side of the app competition here today. Um, 
these are great applications. Uh, a few pieces of feedback that we had for, and, and we'll be sharing with the developers. Um, and, but there's a, hopefully we'll see them next year, potentially, if they, if they submit again. Um, the first of these is from PSI. It is a, an application to significantly uh, simplify the configuration of programs. Um, the second is a very exciting collaboration with the University of Alabama and Huntsville and NASA to import uh, Earth observation data into DHIS2. And the third is Tracker Data Cleaner, which uh, supports deduplication of users in DHIS2. Um, we've got a lot of noise going on here and some questions, maybe. Hmm? Oh, too many requests. How many, how many of you are there? <laughs> uh, we might we might be able to extend the time just a little bit, but hopefully keep trying. You can get in. Don't vote too many times. Don't ask your friends to vote. That's not cool. Um, <laughs> don't don't set a bot network to vote for you. Uh, the yep, these three uh, honorable mentions are uh, um, hopefully we'll submit next year and and you'll 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 hear more from them. Uh, I also wanted to thank while well, we have a, a minute left here, I wanted to thank the great team that has helped to put together this annual conference for you. Um, it's not working still. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. We have a too many requests error. Votes are coming. But... Votes are coming. So Votes are coming. The, uh, the voting is taking place on the DHS2 community of practice. And if you're in the Zoom meeting, you'll see that Gasim has posted the link to the COP thread there where you can vote. Can I, can I put that on the screen? We are voting through the community of practice. Uh, if you're on the COP right now, you can find the thread to vote. And if you're on the Zoom meeting for this session, you can also see that Gasim has posted the link in the chat there. Oh, the community has too many requests. <laughs> yeah, I know, we're crashing the community. <laughs> oh, <it's, laughs> so you should be able to find it on the community of practice. Don't refresh too many times. You might break everything for everyone. Um, but we do have lots of votes coming in. So thank you all for, for those of you who have voted. Keep trying. If you haven't gotten in yet, it will come through. I uh, wanted to thank again the, the team that has been working with me to put on this annual conference. So I want to, let's, let's give a round of applause to, to this team. Reviewing applications, communicating with applicants and finalists and, and putting on the show here tonight, uh, which I have one more minute before I have to turn over the stage to, uh, to someone else. So we should have, uh, hopefully every, most people have gotten in to vote. No, no. All right, we'll still, we'll still, Pause for just a, uh, another minute. Keep trying, please keep trying. I think we might we might need some uh, some new servers for this community of practice. Uh, you have to tell me when you want to stop the voting. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, If that were a DHS2 server, it would be up and running. So we're reopening the voting just in case you haven't gotten in yet. Please try again. <laughs> Apologies for the technical difficulties. I think we should probably do some horizontal scaling and load balancing on this community of practice for next year. This is going to be the most controversial result oh, ever, I think. You want to hand out these we're waiting? Uh, in the meantime, one of one of our uh, the developers on the core team made these really awesome uh, DHIS two magnets, three D printed DHIS two magnets uh, that are going to be. Uh, uh, prizes for all of our finalists. Um, hopefully we can get them to the finalists that aren't here today, but 
Um, for those of you who are here, if you could come up here and and uh, collect your your uh, finalist prize of these DHS two magnets, and let let me know how many people are on your team if you want a few of them. We have we have a few extras. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, five of them. Mark, yeah, sure. Thank you. One more. One more. Wait, wait, what more? <laughs> How many do you want? Okay. Uh, you can take maybe these for now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. How many How many do you have? There are little magnets for DHS for magnets. How many are you on your team? Yeah, okay. Great. All right. How are we doing? How are we looking? 130 votes total. All right, we have about 130 votes total. If you haven't gotten in yet, raise your hand. Keep trying. <laughs> ah, good question. Or good, good suggestion. So if you if you get off of the conference Wi-Fi, if you have a phone and you have a mobile internet connection, that will let you get in. Uh, because it's coming, and so everybody that it thinks we're hackers that are trying to hack from one one place and, <laughs> and overwhelm the system, which maybe we are. I don't know. Um, so if you if you having trouble getting in and you have access to a data um, a mobile data connection, please try that. We're gonna give it another thirty seconds, and then I'm gonna turn over the stage. So try to get in if you can. Are you under dramatic countdown? Um, Austin, yeah. Austin, can you hear me? Hello? Herman, did you want to say something? Yes, yes. we have a comment uh, on in the chat saying that the UDSM app should be all DSR app. I think that we use the, the old name in the voting just for as a clarification. Ah. OK. Yeah, so there's a, an older name for the UDSM application in the voting, I believe. Um, but yeah. the one that is by UDSM is the is is the UDSM application. And our community coordinator, Gassim, would like to um, make a clarification that the lifetime recognition uh, badges are actually designed by our expert uh, UX designer, Joe Cooper. <laughs> nice. Credit credit where credit's due. Uh, Joe designed the badges. Gassim had the idea and, and put it into action. So great, great team effort there. All right, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Let's close the voting. I think we have 150 votes or so, so that's that's a good number. Hopefully, um, hopefully we have a clear winner. <laughs> yeah, drum roll, please. We have winners. Do you want to just show it? Do you want to just? Do you want me to just? Do you want me to just say it? Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. All right. So our our winner for the category of Android is. The CCM app by Philip Larson. And that's not all. The winner for the web app category of the app competition, the DHS Annual Conference 2022, is the Program Indicator Disaggregator by His Tanzania and Gift and Go. <laughs> Again, thank you very much to all of our people that submitted applications, all of our finalists, honorable mentions, and the team. Great work. And thank you all for putting up with terrible voting experience. <laughs> and now we will turn it over to the closing of the DGS2 Annual Conference 2022. Thank you all very much. <laughs>